for this event. We, we very much appreciate it. Um, you know, today we are joined by outgoing UN Special Rapporteur, uh, David Kay, to explore how threats of freedom of expression have, have really evolved over the course of his six year term um, as it comes to a close. This will be an opportunity to celebrate David's work and accomplishments and achievements, as well as to do a deep dive into some of the key issues that are really threatening freedom of expression today, both online and offline. In the past six years, we've been incredibly um, thankful that your reports as Special Rapporteur have looked at both the online and the offline environments and really try and help define some of the cutting edge issues that we need to address if we're looking to really protect freedom of expression in the 21st century and going forward. Issues such as anonymity and encryption, um, online content regulation, digital access, all of these have broadened our understanding of how freedom of expression intersects with these key digital rights issues, particularly looking to put forward progressive international standards that can really be the benchmarks against which we can measure our progress going ahead. Um, you know, in, in addition to David's kind of intellectual fierceness on freedom of expression, he's also a funny, warm, and generous individual. So I'm really thankful to have the opportunity to kind of celebrate both your intellectual and standards accomplishments, as well as what you have brought to the freedom of expression community personally. We've been very lucky to have you as a champion um, in our space and hope to continue that moving forward. You know, over, over recent years, um, yes, don't, don't think you're gonna get out of this without some personal reflections being thrown your way, David. So, <laughs> and we appreciate the opportunity to do so. Um, but over these recent years, there's been a lot of challenges for freedom of expression, which have only grown more complex and detailed with individuals targeted for criticism, dissent, reporting the truth, et cetera. Most pervasively, we have seen technologies that were originally designed and thought to help raise up individual voices and allow people to speak broadly. To, these technologies are now being used to silence people and silence voices on a mass scale. Um, additionally, across the globe, attacks on journalists have intensified while governments continue to silence criticism or dissent, specifically within repressive legal frameworks, uh, looking at things such as fake news, issues of insult and defamation, terrorism or extremism. You know, we know that the frontier and the battleground for freedom of expression will be online going forwards. We've seen these crackdowns on freedom of expression increasingly extended into the digital realm because of this, including internet shutdowns, website blocking and filtering, interference in tools for encryption and anonymity, and the deployment of tools for mass and unlawful surveillance of individuals. We've seen freedom of expression increasingly depending um, on the generosity of private hands and private companies. Every day we see millions of pieces of content which are taken down, not with reference to international human rights law or standards, but in accordance with community standards and or algorithms that are in the handful, a small handful of social media companies. So it's paramount more than ever that we reflect on these persisting and emerging challenges and what action needs to be taken from the international community going forward. So alongside with David Kay, we'll be joined by three esteemed panelists and thank you all for joining us at various times and time zones in the world. Um, Maria Ressa, we're very pleased to have you with us. She's the CEO and executive editor of Rappler, an online news website in the Philippines. Maria is a renowned investigative journalist uh, and was included as part of Time's Person of the Year in 2018. In June this year, Maria was convicted for the so-called cyber libel in the Philippines for her journalistic work, part of a systematic and pervasive attack on freedom of the press in the Philippines. This attack and the attacks on Maria and her colleagues has spawned an international hold the line campaign to support her and press freedom in the Philippines globally. Luis Fernandez Garcia is the executive director of R3D, a leading digital rights organization in Mexico. With R3D, um, he has helped unearth the widespread abuse of surveillance technologies against activists and journalists in Mexico. Luis's work has helped make headlines worldwide, including on the front page of the New York Times. So thank you, Luis, for being able to join us as well. And then finally, we have Julia Wono, the executive director of Internet Sans Frontiers, an organization which works for a free and open internet. Julie is a leading expert in digital rights and works at the forefront of freedom of expression online. 
Her expertise is demonstrated as a fellow both at Harvard and Stanford University, as well as her recent appointment as a board member of the new um, Facebook Oversight Board. So thank you again, Julie, for, for being with us. In particular, I would like to acknowledge and thank the permanent mission of Canada to the United Nations who are co-sponsoring this event. Canada has shown strong leadership on freedom of expression on issues, including joining the core group um, on freedom of expression resolution that's been passed at this very own 44th session of the Human Rights Council. So thank you very much. I will now give the floor to Ambassador Leslie Norton, the permanent representative of Canada to the United Nations and the Conference on Disarmament in Geneva. Thank you very much, Ambassador Norton. Thanks very much, Quinn. Can you hear me? Yes. Wonderful. Thank you. So thank you for that introduction and for inviting Canada to participate in this important event. Uh, Canada has, has long been and remained a staunch supporter of the freedom of expression, as you had mentioned. Uh, we share the concerns of, of civil society and special mandate holders on the current state of freedom of expression and the worrying trends of threats harassment and violence experienced by many around the globe, including in digital contexts, simply by exercising this basic right. We agree that journalists need to be better protected in their work. According to the World Press Freedom Index, prepared by Reporters Without Borders, the number of countries regarded as safe, where journalists can work in complete security, continues to decline, while author authoritarian regimes continue to tighten their grip on the media. Attacks and acts of intimidation against journalists and other media professionals continue. What is most concerning to Canada is the impunity with which these acts continue. Accountability is critical to stemming these threats. We must acknowledge the important role of women journalists and other marginalized groups in this exercise, or in the exercise, promotion and protection of press freedom and the specific risks that they face in the exercise of their work. It's not only journalists that face increasing pressures on their freedom of expression, civil society and individuals pressing for democratic change, environmental activists protesting adverse business practices, and whistleblowers calling it corruption have all seen their space to speak out diminished. To make matters worse, COVID-19 has had an amplifying effect on efforts to suppress freedom of expression. Under Article 4 of the ICCPR, measures to temporarily restrict freedom of expression cannot be inconsistent with obligations under international law and cannot be discriminatory. Our international legal obligations underline that the pandemic should not be used as a pretext to limit the right of freedom of expression or deny access to information. In spite of these negative trends, there are a number of positive initiatives countering threats to freedom of expression. So Canada is proud of the leadership role it's taken to help strengthen press freedom globally. Alongside the UK, we co-hosted co the inaugural Global Conference for Media Freedom in July last year. The Media Freedom Coalition, one of the outcomes of the conference has made important progress and welcomes the support it has received. So the coalition is a partnership of 35 countries and other stakeholders working together proactively to advocate for press freedom. We also launched the new Global Media Defense Fund, which is administered by UNESCO and issued its first call for proposals in April 2020. Canada has contributed $5 million to this fund and we look forward to excellent results once these proposals have been evaluated. And Canada is working on plans for the second global conference. Our priority will be to harness constructive debate and identify forward thinking solutions to the issues before us. We need to ensure that the voice of journalists, civil society organizations, and media companies are, it, are appropriately reflected in any efforts to address media freedom. While we're still in the early phases of developing the program, we recognize the need to take into account the new challenges and opportunities presented by the introduction of digital technologies. In this context, in June 2019, Canada, in partnership with Amnesty International, hosted a side event with the Special Rapporteur for Freedom of Opinion and Expression, Mr. David Kay, and Mr. Ron Diebert of, of the Monk Center's Citizen Lab on the topic of surveillance technology and human rights. Surveillance technology is a key focus for both David and Citizen Lab, in particular the sale of technologies to regimes that use it to harm human rights defenders. This session, moderated by my predecessor, dissected the specific case of NSO Group against which Amnesty filed a lawsuit after NSO Group's technology was used to track some of Amnesty's employees who were investigating the links between NSO Group, Saudi Arabia, and the murder of journalist Kamal Khashoggi. While only a single case, it is, it's really an effective analogy, I think, for the challenges to free speech in digital contexts. Canada strongly supports the work of the Special Rapporteur, and uh, during the 43rd session, 
of the HRC Canada and the Netherlands led a successful consensus resolution that renewed the mandate of the Special Rapporteur, which will ensure that David's uh, successor can continue his good work. And I'd like to take this opportunity to thank David for his excellent advocacy, uh, his intellectual fierceness, uh, just to quote Quinn, I really liked that, and his essential reporting on freedom of expression during his tenure. And finally, as many of you are aware, Canada, along with our core group partners, again, as mentioned by Quinn, so our, they include Brazil, Fiji, Namibia, the Netherlands, and Sweden, uh, we're leading the first comprehensive and substantive resolution on freedom of opinion expression since 2009. So during these extraordinary times, the core group has constructively engaged with as many delegations and civil society organizations as possible through in-person and virtual hybrid meetings. Uh, it seems to be more of a challenge as we're mixing the, the hybrid meetings, uh, the in-person and the virtual. So uh, hats off to the colleagues who hoping, we're still hoping to have a successful outcome. And I'm looking to my left because one of the key uh, people is sitting next to me. Um, so we've crafted a strong text, including with inputs from those participating in this event that expands the Human Rights Council's norms of, of, on freedom of opinion and expression. So I'm going to just name five parts here. We have furthered the Council's consideration of the right to access to information, uh, extended language on the rights of women in the context of freedom of opinion and expression, anchored the right to access to information in the 2030 Agenda and in business and human rights, made strong links between freedom of opinion and expression to democracy and, and combating corruption, and safeguarded language in support of journalists and other media workers, civil society and human rights defenders. So we're confident that these initiatives and others emanating from this work and from that of others will constitute really important steps in the international community's efforts to promote and protect freedom of expression. Canada, along with our state and civil society partners, will continue our efforts to stem the tide of threats to this bedrock freedom. So thank you, and back to Quinn, and I really look forward to hearing from this amazing panel that, that is joining us today. So thanks very much. And, and thank you, and thank you again for Canada and for the core group trying to push forward our international standards on freedom of expression. That's definitely needed in this time. So first, I'm going to turn to, to David, put you a little bit on the hot seat. This, this is your event as well. You know, over the past six years, you've been kind of the focal point for a lot of work that's been done in terms of submissions made on some of the vague, disproportionate, vague laws and disproportionate attacks that have come on freedom of expression champions, whether they're journalists or human rights defenders. Um, these have ranged from laws that harass journalists worldwide to more specific instances of attacks. Now, what trends have you seen emerging through communications to you as a UN Special Rapporteur over time? And, and what are some of the things that you pull out as kind of key concerns from the submissions and the trends that you've witnessed? Great. Uh, Quinn, first off, thank you for organizing, organizing this event. And thanks to, to Callum, who folks can't see, who, who did all the leg, leg work here. And thank you, Ambassador Norton, for your introduction as well. I mean, the work, the work of the mandate is um, is really dependent on two stakeholders. It's dependent on governments in the human and the Human Rights Council, uh, governments that support our work, and Canada, uh, the Netherlands, uh, many other uh, delegations have been essential to that. And so I want to really thank you deeply for for all of that. And the other is civil society. I mean, this this mandate was really created as an initiative back in the early 1990s of Article 19 uh, and has been supported by, you know, my co-panelists here, um, you know, in, in all sorts of ways. And that's sort of my segue to saying uh, how great it is to be on a panel with Maria, Julia, and Luis Fernando. I'm people who I've been lucky to work with over the last several years and who've inspired me and I think inspired a lot of people uh, doing, doing this kind of work, whether it's journalist protection, internet shutdowns uh, or, or targeted surveillance. I mean, you, you, you folks are leaders and obviously Quinn and Article 19, um, you know, a central central uh, actor in, in all of this work. Okay, so that's my like buttering you all up so that we have a real, you know, great conversation here. But um, I think the thing that I would say about communications is I'd say a couple of things. First off, you know, everybody who's, who's watching this should understand that um, we are kind of in, in special procedures of the UN, 
in a sense, we're, we're kind of triggered by input that we get from, from civil society and sometimes from, from governments, but mainly from civil society. I mean, the, the communications that we send to governments, that is allegation letters about particular violations or um, concerns about legislation or whatever our communication to a government might be, it really depends on, um, on getting information from civil society. It, the, the first step is always civil society, an organization or an indiv individual reaching out to us and saying, here's this violation and I, I really would like you to connect with the government. That's essential. And, and in the course, so to answer your, your question directly, Quinn, the kinds of trends that we've seen have been really related to the kinds of trends I think that, that are at the heart of the work of everybody on this panel. I've seen a, um, I would say, I mean, it may sound glib, but the bread and butter work tends to be around attacks on journalists um, and others who are uh, trying to express themselves. Increasingly, that's about the expression uh, online. So Rappler.com is a, a perfect example of that. It's, it's journalism and it's the digital. And governments, particularly in an era of you know, increased you know, populism that I think you know, really is connected to you know, a hunger for power and a lot of corruption, um, they're putting pressure on, on all sorts of actors, but especially journalists. And we're getting a lot of uh, information from civil society around the world on, on those kinds of issues. And then we communicate directly with governments about that. We're also seeing it around things like internet shutdowns. So obviously, and this is one of the things that, I mean, Julie has been working on um, around the world, but particularly as we saw over the last several years, a kind of epidemic of shutdowns in Africa, in South Asia, in other places, we've had um, you know, kind of increasing um, reports from individuals about the pressure that that's put on them, not just as a matter of freedom of expression, but, but economic, social, cultural rights. Um, and then we get quite a bit on issues related to, to surveillance. And so Luis Fernando's work in Mexico, I think, is, is kind of um, essential to that and a, an example of that, where we see how so many um, instances around the world are occurring where either it's targeted surveillance or mass surveillance that we often think of as a, you know, kind of purely as a, a privacy issue, um, has a real impact on, um, on journalists, on others, and their freedom of expression. So that's the kind of, um, you know, uh, information that we're receiving, and that triggers a lot of our, our, work, of our work. And I, I would say at a, and I'll, I'll close on this, I would say that our communications are mainly designed, I mean, the whole purpose uh, that, uh, you know, for the Human Rights Council to create this mechanism has been to establish room for dialogue between monitors of, of human rights who've been, you know, mandated by the Human Rights Council to do this work. You know, sometimes states react as if we're acting beyond the scope of our mandate. You know, we're just doing what the Human Rights Council has asked us to do, to monitor human rights and to highlight, to gather concerns from around the world, highlight those to governments. The problem has been that governments often don't even respond to us. You know, so we will send a letter and maybe in a good instance, we'll get a letter back from the mission in Geneva, because that's our, our pathway to connecting with governments. We'll get a letter back that says, um, thank you for your, uh, for your message. Uh, we sent it to capitals or to the capital and we'll never hear anything back. And our response rate um, is somewhere around 50%. And I would say that the vast majority of that 50% is um, procedural. Occasionally we get a substantive response. And I, I remember we did a communication to France last year on its hate speech law uh, as it was you know, heading through the legislative process. And the government of France responded with a very full response. I didn't agree with half of it, but it was a full response. That's the process. And because so many governments don't even acknowledge our letters, we have over the years really, I think, been driven towards things like press statements that um, tend to anger governments, but 
you know, if we don't have the dialogue, we're going to go public with our concerns. It's driven us towards publicizing our legislative comments, because why would we comment on legislation if the legislature doesn't get to see our comments and our criticisms or our concerns? And it's also driven us towards things like amicus filing, so finding other um, kind of pathways to engage with governments and the court systems in, in, in countries um, because governments aren't um, connecting with us. So, I mean, I would say that the communications process is essential. Eventually, all of our communications become public. Um, but because of that lack of dialogue, it's really changed the nature of, uh, of special procedures to be a much more public, um, public thing. And that's, it's not because we want to be public figures. It's because that dialogue has, for whatever reason, um, been attenuated. And we, we just don't get that kind of dialogue. So that's, you know, I would encourage listeners to use this system because it can be a really valuable way to educate us and to, to be a part of your advocacy, to be honest. Thanks, David. I think there's a lot of kind of interesting richness potentially to go into there about the way that the mandate has been kind of forced to evolve. And as you say, kind of this public communication and what that means for some of the pressures that are actually put on the mandates in the UN system. But I wanted to touch first on um, one of the issues that you raised, which was Maria's case in particular. So your recent conviction on the cyber libel sent a pretty chilling tenor across freedom of expression worldwide, particularly for journalists, Maria. It was, it was fairly devastating. You know, what, what precedent do you think this particular case sets? Um, and, and what does this mean for the media in the Philippines and worldwide? Um, thanks, Quinn. And, you know, uh, like, kudos, David, for all of the work and, and everyone on, on the panel. I think uh, June is a, was a horrible, the last few months of lockdown have been horrendous for freedom of speech and freedom of expression in the Philippines. Uh, we've had, well, where do I begin? Uh, I think the first is that uh, my conviction was only, you know, was, was me and my colleague but this was for a law that was actually enacted after we published the story. So it's retroactive application. David actually uh, submitted an amicus brief on, on this case. And uh, you know, our, our judge, Judge Montessa came back and just wrote one, one word uh, regarding his brief, noted, um, nothing else. Uh, it's one of eight arrest warrants that I have, but right after, uh, just last Friday, our House of Representatives uh, denied the franchise of the largest broadcaster in the Philippines. It would be like denying the franchise of uh, CNN or BBC, right? Um, it would be um, largely political freedom of speech. Again, uh, it's 11,000 people whose, who, whose jobs have just been lost and the layoffs the notices started going out today. I think with what everyone said from us, what I've what we've gone through is, you know, first we've seen this democracy's death by a thousand cuts. First, with the technology, the deli the way news is delivered today, social media. So there's first the toxic hate that goes in, and then uh, the second part, the surveillance, of course, all of this. And then the third, of course, is I think the one thing that hasn't really been explored has been the way the law has been weaponized. And it's happening not just in the Philippines, in Malaysia, uh, for example, this week, Malaysia Kini, another digital outfit, Malay uh, their editor in chief was essentially hauled to court to be cited in contempt or uh, for a comment somebody posted on their site. So we're seeing this all around. I guess, you know, I, I, I want to just use my example and I hate being the example all the time, but I think that's why you invite me because I lived through this. Um, you know, uh, there's one very simple example of how information is power and how it has been used to gain and keep power. And this is in the last four years, uh, just a narrative. Let's look at how, how people's minds get changed, right? So the narrative, journalist equals criminal, was first thrown into our Facebook ecosystem in 2016. That was uh, when the drug war began, not a, not a coincidence. And uh, when, when it was first used to describe me, I laughed because I, I thought, you know, in 2016, I thought, yeah, good luck, 
<laughs> you know, I mean, I'm a journalist. I have by next year, it'll be 35 years that I've been a journalist uh, and I have a, a track record. So I felt kind of invincible, you know, in the last four years, that's really eroded because in 2016, it was pounded a lot, repeated. And we know now a lie told a million times becomes a fact. That's what uh, this behavioral modification system we call social media does. And then in 2017, it comes from top down, so bottom up and then top down from government. President Duterte attacks us, calls us criminals also. And then 2018, I get 11 cases and investigations. In 2019, I get arrested twice in a five week period. I have eight arrest warrants. I have to post bail, all of that. And in 2020, on June 15th, I was, along with a former colleague, I was convicted. So journalist equals criminal. Um, this, is, this is how democracy dies. Uh, the technology allows uh, populist authoritarian style leaders to essentially take power and then cave it in from within, cave it in, right? And I think that's, you know, what with ABS-CBN shutdown, it's, it's really emblematic, but the tough thing is it happened May 5th when we were in a lockdown. If it had been at any other time, you would have seen people out on the streets. It would have probably been virtually impossible to have done it. Uh, in the time of COVID, uh, it happened and it didn't matter, right? It became normal very quickly. And the last time ABS-CBN was shut down was in 1972 when Ferdinand Marcos declared martial law and it was shut down for 14 years. So I worry that we are right now at the precipice. And the verdict in my cyber libel case uh, began the codification into law changing everything of these kinds of ad hoc attacks, uh, ad hoc abuses of power. Uh, now with this, the cyber libel, this, this conviction basically changes the statute of limitations for all Filipinos from one year to 12 years. And then there's just shortly after that, we passed an anti-terror bill that has become a law. President Duterte signed it. And this one now allows a small group of cabinet secretaries to designate someone a terrorist. That could be me, right? And because of that, you, they, you can be arrested without a warrant and held detained for up to 24 days. This is now being challenged at the Supreme Court, but that's the codification and we are transforming in front of your eyes and the normalization of a new kind. You know, I. I, I start to joke that, you know, we're really a dictatorship masquerading as a democracy with rule of law. Um, having said that, you know, I, I, I feel like I've been talking about this, but, you know, David filed an amicus brief in this case. And I, I'd be curious to hear what he thinks about it now because because of what happened. Yeah, I, so I'm happy to jump in. Maria, first off, I think what you described just now is, I mean, on the one hand, because because we're friends and so many people who are, are on this call, I think are, are friends and are inspired by you, it's, it's chilling. But at the same time, it is also deeply reflective, what you described, of the experience of journalists in so many parts of the world. I mean, the redefinition of journalism as a criminal act or as terrorism, I mean, that's something that we've seen in Turkey for a decade, right? Um, the, uh, the pressure, the, the cybercrime law, that also is exactly what we're seeing around the world. We're seeing states adopting rules that are um, creating new and more intensive uh, punishments merely because the, the expression or the reporting is online. And, and I think the thing that I would say about the amicus that we filed in your case was, I would just say a couple of things. One is um, the Philippines has international human rights obligations. It's a party to the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. In, in its past um, cases, it's made a, an acknowledgement of its obligations. None of that comes through in, in the court decision. And part of our, I think our role in, in filing an amicus is, you know, to re remind the state, you know, this, this isn't just about your domestic obligations. This is about 
the obligations that you have solemnly taken on as a member of the international community. A second thing, sort of in reaction to, to our amicus and to our complaints about the case, you know, mine and others in special procedures, the, the government has basically said, why are you complaining about us? This was a private actor uh, that brought a defamation case against Maria Ressa and a colleague and Rappler.com. And that's, that's absurd. I mean, the government uh, several years ago adopted a cybercrime law that was designed to facilitate exactly this kind of an attack on journalists. And frankly, this kind of an attack on, on you and on Rappler. And I think the idea, and this goes to your kind of the disguise that a government might create, the idea that this law suddenly provides a kind of cloak of legitimacy around anything that individuals uh, might do in order to enforce it is completely absurd. You know, the government creates laws that are themselves inconsistent with human rights standards and then complains about or says we have nothing to do with its enforcement by individuals. It's, it's frankly um, absurd and we should be calling it out. And that's what our amicus tried to do. Now we, we call it out in a legal framework uh, you know, I'm sorry that uh, that the court just noted uh, our amicus, but but you know, my hope is that you know the fight is not over, and there'll be opportunities to to raise these claims moving forward as well. Quinn, do you mind? I, I just want to quickly pick up on on what David said because I think sure. this is, just one more. This is, this is a global thing, right? I mean, what he described of, you know, this is a private individual, that's not just what government says, that's what was astroturfed on social media. And this is what I'll call influence operations, right? The influence operations have been going on since 2016, not just here in the Philippines, but all around the world. So when they do this, the influence operations, the goal of that is to exponentially pound people so it's an astroturf manufacturing consensus to make them believe something and they do so the goal of the influence operations is to change the way people think and the way they act all right so you you know what happened to me in the philippines what about the united states right where in 2016 we know from the Mueller report that you actually had russian disinformation influence operations that were carried out there. This is a fact, the data came out. And one of the targets was to pound a fissure line of, of society open was Black Lives Matter on both sides of Black Lives Matter. Again, you fast forward four years, the impact on real people is real. And this is what I think, you know, this is why I call social media behavioral modification system. Thanks, thanks very much for that, Maria. And I want to pick up on, I mean, uh, from the U.S. perspective, I wish it was only 2016 that we're worried about. I think we have a pretty challenging environment facing us in 2020 as well. That's only gotten worse. Um, but you mentioned something about kind of information is power and this issue as well with the astroturfing. A lot of this is going towards trying to control the narrative of people. Control the narrative because the narrative is power in and of itself. And we've seen, as you said, this astroturfing, that's particularly these influencing operations, but that's often married with surveillance. And so it's, it's not just the astroturfing, it's also kind of surveillance that can be put on things. You know, David, in your report last year to the UN Rights Council, you really highlighted this issue of surveillance and called for a moratorium um, on these privately developed surveillance tools and the way that they're being used and called for really rigorous human rights safeguards to be put in place. Uh, how, how do you think that this, sur these threats of surveillance have really evolved over the recent years? And if you have time to comment on this just a little bit, it'd be interesting to hear if you have any perspectives. And I know it's really new, but the, the ruling that just came down today from, from Europe about the, the EU-US privacy shield law basically being invalidated because specifically of concerns about US surveillance. Yeah, so I'm, I'm really glad Luis Fernando is here because he can talk in like real specific terms about the nature of of targeted surveillance, of private surveillance, of this industry. Um, and I've learned a lot from him about, about this issue. So, I mean, I would say briefly on, on targeted surveillance um, and on surveillance more generally, um, something, you know, I said at the beginning that, uh, that surveillance has not just a privacy implication, 
but it has a freedom of expression implication. It is, it is designed much as, you know, the astroturfing that we're talking about or like defamation claims against individuals. It is designed to silence people or at least to, to cause people to think twice about what they are going to use their phone for, what they're going to report, um, what they're going to say to their, you know, their spouse or to their friends. It's, it is a, it's an intensive kind of pressure on, on freedom of expression. And, and I think, you know, it's sometimes hard to believe that it's been seven years, a little over seven years since Edward Snowden's revelations came to light. But I think that since that time, we've seen an evolution in the debate from, from the mass surveillance and the real problems of mass surveillance and living in a society that is um, kind of infused with different surveillance technologies, you know, frankly, whether those are government or, or the private kind of commercial surveillance that we're all willingly entering into with, with social media companies. But we've seen that evolve into real concern and understanding that, that these tools um, are not just available to the wealthy countries with you know, significant um, intelligence capabilities, but they're available to countries that may not have that capability, but they can now go purchase it. It's not cheap, but it's not that expensive to go to an Israeli or European or an American company and say, you know, what's your off the shelf solution for us to track this journalist? And that, that's a huge problem. It's been a, a real uh, problem in a place like Mexico. Um, and I think that that, you know, Quinn, you mentioned this new European Court of Justice decision related to Privacy Shield. And there's, there's two things I would say about it. Um, it's like my hot take, right? Because, I mean, it's 640 in the morning here, so I haven't, I haven't read the decision. So my hot take without having read it would be one, um, you know, uh, Europeans some, and European, I think this is what's super interesting about it, European policymakers, like at elite levels, at the level of the court, you know, judges, um, they don't trust American law to, or, or American institutions to protect the privacy of Europeans. And that, to me, that's very interesting because despite this, you know, it was um, years worth of work to create Privacy Shield, European judges don't trust it. They don't trust uh, the discretion in U.S. government officials. And I think that's, that's interesting on its own terms, but it's also interesting because Europe is moving towards, you know, a, a digital surveillance act, a, a digital services act that, um, you know, that will uh, involve rethinking regulation of social media in Europe. And I think this is a message to Americans that um, there's not going to be a kind of uh, you know, trust but verify kind of approach to American companies. I, I think people should understand that Europeans are deeply alienated from and skeptical of American law, American institutions, and American companies. And the other thing that I would just mention is, you know, this was a Max Schrems uh, initiative. Um, it was an initiative of civil society and of a particular individual. And I think there's still in, in Europe um, but also in many other places around the world, there still is um, individual agency to challenge these kinds of laws. And, and to me, that's like whatever you think of the decision, that's, that's amazing. I mean, that, that, is, that should give us a little bit of hope that there are still tools available in democratic society. So even in a place you know, where we've seen the rise of populism in Europe and, and Brexit and other things happening that might you know, cause us to doubt the future of democracy, even in Europe. Um, I think, you know, those fundamentals still exist and, um, and give me, you know, like kind of make me optimistic about, about the future of regulation, about the future of, of even democratic norms in, in Europe. And hopefully that, that can be said for other places as well. Thanks very much for that, David. And sorry to put you on the spot, but appreciate your hot take <laughs> at, at the present. Um, Luis Fernando, if I could turn to you for, for a minute, just to kind of take on, as David said, your work in Mexico has really been at the forefront of exposing a lot of the way that these surveillance technologies have been used pervasively, um, not just against political actors or journalists, but I think actually in Mexico, the first 
the documented cases of some of the surveillance spyware system being used was actually against anti-obesity campaigners. So people who are trying to push back against the sugar lobby, which I think demonstrates that these tools are being used in a number of ways that are deeply problematic in terms of silencing voices overall and trying to shift debates internally. Um, what, what do you think that the international community um, should take from the way that these surveillance tools have been deployed in Mexico? What's the lesson for us? Well, first, thank you so much for the invitation to Article 19, the Government of Canada. And of course, it's an honor and I cannot not say something about uh, the tenure of David Kay, which has been essential. I think it's a blueprint of how a, a mandate like this should work. Um, and I hope many reporters take take note about what happened with the work of David Kay, because I think in, in, in entering into the question, um, the way in which, uh, as David has mentioned, the, the work that, that complements itself between civil society, even companies, uh, uh, rapporteur, governments, has really, really helped move the conversation forward, because particularly in the issue of surveillance, because surveillance has relied a lot on secrecy to, uh, paradoxically, uh, because uh, surveillance means that the government and companies can know a lot about us, but we know very little about how they know what they know about us, which is a, a, a problem. But I, I really think that, that uh, we have moved from a very simplistic post 9-11 discussion of privacy versus security and really got into the details and got rid of that simplistic vision that just gives you two options that are non-realistic uh, and really it dwells into the issues, no? So, and I think the issue of targeted surveillance and the work that David has, has highlighted, uh, I mean, I think this, and I cannot just say that this was my work or, or my organization. There's a lot of people that have worked around the world that we have worked with to try to start to shed light into this dark room of how surveillance works. And I think what we have found is something that is very troubling, but now also I think we're better equipped as civil society and, and as people in different levels uh, 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 and in every stakeholder possible that believes that surveillance is a problem and that privacy is, is relevant, particularly because of these, as some of you have mentioned, these chilling effects that they have in, in society uh, and these network effects that, that create even uh, uh, consequences that are invisible to us. Um, but I really think uh, these cases and the, the work that, that David has, has done is equipping everyone better to try to confront these issues. And, I, and I'm gonna give a few examples of, of the challenges that you find uh, with regard to this technology. First, it's uh, almost impossible to detect these cases. Um, we were lucky and there was also a lot of work behind by a lot of people to try to get these examples of which are really just probably or most likely or, or certainly uh, a tip of the iceberg. You know? uh, we don't know really that much about the problem, but what we already know just by looking at the tip is completely worrying. So uh, I really think that that's the first problem. There's, there's, we, they really, uh, bent, uh, I have this written down, trust but verify, and just David K took it from me before I said it, but um, uh, it, I really think there's, there's, there's this, uh, I think governments particularly have lost the opportunity and the advantage of being trusted on this. Uh, they have shown time and time again, and not only uh, dictatorships, also governments and, and countries, for example, Mexico, in which is formal democracy, but that the line between for example, organized crime and the state sometimes is blurry and non-existent. But also we've seen the past week a government, a democratic government, European government like Spain, using this type of tools against political dissidents. Uh, uh, so definitely it's clear that this system is, is wrong, uh, that surveillance is out of control and particularly targeted surveillance and, and, and high-tech malware, uh, which has been a focus of, of our work and, and David's as well, uh, shows this because it's not only this secrecy, general secrecy that surveillance, surveillance apparatus has, but these tools are being designed particularly to not be found, to not leave traces, to, to basically they have inbuilt impunity on them. And that's a problem from the design of the tools themselves. 
uh, there is an expectation and there is, and everything is set up against victims. Um, because then when you, you happen to find out uh, uh, proof or evidence of a possible or an actual attack with this type of malware, then there's a whole range of obstacles that you have. First, governments usually deny that they even have the tool. And then you have to prove that they have it. And then you have to rely on whistleblowers, which is something that also the, the rapporteur has, has, has talked about a lot and, and the importance of encryption and anonymity to try to unveil this public interest information that is hidden. Uh, but even when you prove that a government has this tool, then there's all this lack of safeguards. For example, we have found it's been more than three years since we unveiled these cases. And we don't know for sure who are all the uh, uh, agencies in Mexico that have this tool. There is no record of who was trained or have the authority to use it. There's no record of who it has been used against. And, and there's all these lack of safeguards in the purchase, in the design, in, in the selling, uh, in this commercial, uh, in both the countries in which these companies exist and, and sell their products and the, and the governments that purchase them and obviously on the use. Obviously the oversight that we have talked about for decades is not working and we uh, need to, and particularly governments need to accept that the, this notion that they can keep all of these secret is, is and we just have to take their word for it, it it's just, Cannot cannot fly, so I, I, I will probably leave it here, here because I can talk for hours about this. But um, uh, but I really think uh, we are a, so a society in general uh, better equipped, and I really really want to thank David for his for his work because I feel um, better prepared to continue to do his work and to have many of their report his reports uh, on my on my arm. Um, to take and to keep giving this fight. And I think we, just to leave it with a positive note, there is uh, opportunities. And, and for example, in Mexico, after a change in government, etc., there is right now a table, something that I never imagined it would exist, in which intelligence security agencies of Mexico are, are sitting down with civil society and we're discussing, okay, how can we make this not happen again? Um, we'll see if, if 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 this is not just posturing posture, posture and it becomes something, but it really, uh, I think uh, uh, the work that many uh, people here, particularly David, has really inspired and guided this discussion in, in, in a meaningful way. And I just, uh, and I think it's important that, that uh, other stakeholders, that other, so governments help other governments that really are at least saying that they want to change and they want to 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 do reform that meaningfully restricts the impacts of these type of technologies to help them and to encourage them to do it. Uh, so, so I think uh, I, I invite everyone here and watching uh, uh, to, to support this process in places like Mexico in which we are trying to figure out uh, the way forward and, and, and a way in which governments need to accept, you cannot just keep everything secret. And because us knowing that you have Pegasus from NSO doesn't, make it less effective. Uh, I can know that you have it, I can know the capabilities of it, uh, and I cannot resist it if you want to target, target me because technology is becoming even more undetectable and impossible to resist. So uh, they need to accept that that era is over and we need to move forward on the details, uh, escaping from these very uh, simplistic views that just paint bad guys, good guys, and, and security versus privacy. It's, it's interesting to hear that, that notion kind of being reflected about, you know, the fundamentally, I mean, Luis Fernando, you're talking about, is there a way of at least building a base level of trust in which there's some transparency that gives people a certain amount of trust in government again, although we're fairly far from, from that point. And, and it seems like that issue of transparency and getting more insight into actions on things is something that comes up quite a bit in the context of the social media companies and the social media giants. Um, and the impacts that they're having on our lives, as you were mentioning, Maria, as well, um, and, and what that means because they're effectively private actors. Now, David, you've gone a certain distance in terms of really laying out what you feel 
the um, certain international standards obligations should be for social media companies and other internet in intermediaries. You know, what, where have you set this bar in terms of the way that you think that we should be thinking going forward? And also I think kind of interest, more interesting for me, do we have any hope of that bar being met <laughs> at the mm -hmm. present time? Yeah, that's, that's a really great question. And I just, just to reflect quickly on, on Luis Fernando and also on, on Maria's comments, because I think they, they connect, right? They connect in the sense that, I mean, this will sound a little, you know, like a conspiracist sort of approach, but everything is connected, right? So, you know, Maria's reporting or Rappler.com's reporting, it's not just about, you know, the professional um, work of Rappler's uh, reporters, it's about society's ability to get access to information. That's connected to what Luis Fernando was talking about, which is how when we lack information about, uh, about what government is doing to conduct surveillance, you know, that's also about what the public gets access to, you know, the information it gets access to. These, these are harms that, like, we may see them often, although I think when Julie talks about about social media and also about um, internet shutdowns, it's possible to see the, the social impact pretty obviously. But even in these cases where we may talk about victims, you know, the victim is not just Maria or Luis Fernando. I mean, that they are, um, but, but the victim is the public that is denied access to information. The shutdown of, um, you know, the main broadcaster in the Philippines that, that's punishment for the employees, but it's it's a disaster for the public's right to information. So I think all of these things are are connected, and and I think they are also connected to social media because social media has you know such an enormous impact. Uh, it, it plays such an enormous role in the flow of information around the world. You know now. If we're talking about the United States or Europe, you know, people may have multiple opportunities for different sources of information. And, you know, you could, you could live your whole life without having access to Facebook or Twitter and still be uh, a, a reasonably well-informed person. You might be more well-informed. Um, you know, it's, but, but in many places around the world, you know, these tools, and including YouTube, um, are are dominant and they are the source of information and they have enormous impact. And, I, and we shouldn't limit it to American companies. It's the same when we're talking ab about, you know, um, VK in Russia or WeChat in, in China. These are massive companies with massive roles. On the one hand, they're subjected to government pressure and government interference. And in that context, the companies really I think deserve the support of freedom of expression campaigners to ensure that governments are not simply using this this medium as a place to impose, uh, you know, new and intense constraints, you know, in constraining the companies, but ultimately really constraining individual expression. So we need to be protecting them from that governments. So when we talk about intermediary liability, for example. It's, you know, it must be necessary and proportionate liability to ensure that this isn't just a new tool for, for censorship. But we also have to be talking about what the companies are doing, you know, maybe in the shadow of government, but really not um, because of government demands. And, you know, the companies have their own rules. They have their own, you know, whether it's community standards, community guidelines, Twitter rules, whatever we might want to call them. And those rules are also shaping the information environment, whether by in kind of the negative sense of saying what you can't speak, what you can't post, but also in, in, the, in a different sense in terms of the algorithmic uh, filtering and shaping of what we see. That we, and that's like the unseen what we see. We don't get to see, we don't have control over our, you know, uh, our algorithmic um, you know, filtering system that tells us what we get to see or not, right? So, you know, I think that as, as a first matter, um, you know, the companies 
need to be applying human rights standards. These are responsibilities that it's not like there's nowhere to go. You can look at the UN guiding principles on business and human rights, and you can set up, you know, this is my human rights policy. This is the framework for how people can appeal if they have a claim about a human rights violation. Um, and, um, and there's, you know, I think Americans tend to think, well, you know, there isn't much law there. There's a lot of law. There are a lot of standards that the companies can draw from in order to frame their space according to human rights standards and at least put individuals and the public's interests first, which is what human rights is all about, and not put you know, the business model uh, first, which is basically the system that we're, we're living in right now. So I think that if companies start there, and you know, we can go for a richer conversation about that, but if we start there, I think that's a that's a real rich direction for companies to head. And do you think we'll get there? Do you think have you seen because you're in an interesting place because you're in California, mm -hmm. um, and so I think the companies have been a bit more responsive to you possibly because of, of where you've been sitting. Do you think you have any potential notes of optimism in that regard? Yeah, I mean, I think some of the companies have been. Um, you know, whether they're explicit about it or not, uh, some of the decisions they've been making have more of a, a human rights feel to them, let's say, right? Mm -hmm. um, the Facebook Oversight Board, right, which Julie is a member of. Um, I mean, the board is, um, it's not clear exactly whether it will apply human rights standards in a, in a you know, very direct way. But, you know, the idea of it is, human rights oriented. It's, it's an oversight approach that, you know, my hope is that that gets expanded across, um, across the industry. It might be minimal compared to all the, all the different ways in which Facebook and other companies frame the information environment, but it is a human rights step. I think Twitter's approach to, to Donald Trump, frankly, although there's much more it can do, I think that it has it has framed its decisions on Trump, you know, related to, to, to COVID and to voting as what is the impact on an individual's right to information? What is the impact on incitement, for example? And I think that's appropriate. And that's, that's a more appropriate way than thinking just, you know, what is the speaker's right? It's also the audience's right. Um, the, the, the fundamental problem, though, will be can these steps be uh, globalized, right? Not in the, like, the globalization, neoliberal way we talk about globalization, but can these rules, which sure, you know, a company in Menlo Park or in San Francisco can do this because, you know, they're in this political, cultural environment in the US, so they know what language means, they know the code word and all that. Can they do that in the Philippines where Facebook has been, I mean, terrifically weaponized as a tool against democracy. Can they do it in a place like Myanmar, where incitement, you know, took place in a language that was opaque to most people at, at Facebook? And that, that's, that's a human rights question that um, I think is an open question. You know, whether the companies can ever get there I wouldn't say I'm skeptical, but I think it's it's something that the gut that the companies have to prove, um, you know, and and I'm not sure I'm just not sure they're capable of meeting that responsibility, given the the scale at which they operate. Thanks, thanks very much for that, David. Um, Julie, would to turn to you a little bit now and to kind of take on some of the ideas that David has put out there in terms of your work at the intersection of human rights and the internet space and what you're seeing in terms of the social media companies as well in terms of what are the trends that are emerging what are some of the key battles that you're seeing kind of taking on some of the issues that have been raised so far thank you quinn um and of course first of all thank you to the permanent mission of canada and article 19 for the the invitation and the honor of being part of the one of probably the last public panel of David as a, a um, sorry, Freedom of Expression Special Rapporteur. Uh, I, of course, cannot start without remembering all these great 
things that um, David has done for the advance advancement of freedom of expression. I have so many examples in mind of his availability and of his team's availability of his, uh, uh, you know, understanding even before everybody ha did, has understood uh, of so many of the challenges that we're facing today. Uh, I have memories also of, you know, his, his influence because uh, I remember once a letter that David, you sent to the authorities of Chad. I don't know if you remember that in 2016. Uh, the authorities had shut down access to Facebook and Twitter, and it had been going on for like more than six months. And right after David sent a letter, a week later, it was, uh, I mean, access was was back. So yes, uh, there, there were lots of achievements, and uh, thank you for that. I, I, wanna, I want to, um, you know, pick up on what you were just saying uh, about platforms meeting the challenges and their responsibilities, because uh, indeed we, we have to use the word, they do have a responsibility. Uh, I like to say that, especially uh, in, in, in global South countries where, like you mentioned, David, people have usually no other access than Facebook uh, and WhatsApp. Uh, so uh, they cannot, I mean, these companies cannot want to profit from these places because we know now that, well, users in, in Northern America and Europe uh, are probably less interested or increasingly less interested in, in Facebook uh, particularly. And therefore the platform is, you know, doubly down, doubling down, sorry, on efforts to uh, make sure users in Global South also have access. And also most importantly, users that are, are not connected yet. So they cannot want to profit from that, but at the same time escape the political responsibility that comes with this and which David rightly um, detailed and explained. So I think they have, I mean, they have no choice. They have to meet the challenges because if they don't, there is another threat that's coming very rapidly, which is increasingly government are using platforms failures as a justification to uh, explain why they need to censor it and uh, allegedly need to censor access to internet. I'll give several examples. Uh, when we talk about hate speech, there is, like David said, there is a problem with hate speech, especially in countries where the institutions are probably not as equipped to deal with those problems as in other places of the world. So, uh, but the problem is that what we're seeing, especially in Africa where uh, we worked a lot the, the past years is that the efforts that companies put to deal with the issues in, in, in Africa, issues related to hate speech are completely disproportionate with the extent of the threat. Uh, but at the same time, the same companies are also doubling down on efforts to be present on the continent. But what happens is that governments are saying, okay, we have no other choice but to shut down internet because Facebook and Twitter and Ali are not doing anything or not doing enough to deal with hate speech. Thus trying to, uh, to hide the real aim of censorship, which is of course to silence openness, to silence free expression. And that's a real danger. And uh, I, I really, I hope platforms, companies are aware of this, you know, reality, new reality and, and even challenge for us as civil society, it's becoming even more difficult to advocate against censorship because a lot of people say, we don't want, you know, ethnic cleansing or whatever in our countries. So why aren't platforms doing anything about that? And it's becoming difficult to tell them, yes, that problem exists, but it's being also weaponized, used by governments, repressive governments to further censor you. So I think that private companies, uh, it's, it's a challenge. It's definitely a new challenge. And one of the first, uh, you know, heads of state who made that connection was the prime minister of Ethiopia, who upon receiving his Nobel Peace Prize last year, said that ex exactly this, that, you know, social media are fueling hatred in his country. And I, I'm afraid many other governments uh, and progressive governments are going to, to get inspiration from that because 
it's uh, I mean, it's it's an argument that 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 is difficult to to counter argue given again the disproportionate efforts put out by companies. So um, that's one sorry one of the challenges that I see. Uh, another challenge that I that I see, and I was hoping maybe David could you know help me help us unpack things there. Uh, again, on this idea that certain governments would use the intersection of freedom of expression with other rights, other imperatives to, well, limit access of their populations to certain tools. And I'm thinking particularly about the debate on TikTok in the US. I was hoping maybe uh, David could help us explain wh when the US government is, you know, suggesting that users in the US should not have access to uh, TikTok because of its, uh, well, pretty lo pretty much loosey privacy policies, loose, sorry, not loosey, loose privacy policies, and, uh, and, and specifically with the possibility of direct access by Chinese authorities to this, uh, to personal data of US citizens. I was wondering if you, I mean, what would be your take on that? Mm. Yeah, that's, that's great. I mean, thanks for all of that. Julie, uh, you know, on, on TikTok, I think there's, there's an element of it that's rich, right? I mean, particularly on a morning when we're talking a little bit about, um, you know, the privacy shield uh, decision and European considerations about um, the, the ability of American law and American institutions to protect privacy. And then, you know, then it's like a cascade. And then there's the American concern and a European concern about the ability of TikTok to protect privacy, given the, the fact that it's, um, you know, uh, ultimately a Chinese company, right? And so, you know, I think, um, I, 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 what, I, what I think is really important on the TikTok issue is to separate two things, right? So on the one hand, there are some very, very serious issues around um, China's access to any social media or any internet company that's based in China. Um, this isn't a question of, you know, like needing a warrant to get user data. Um, this isn't something like, uh, like that at all. It's you know, it's like in Russia, there's kind of a direct line to, to, to user data. So there is no such thing as privacy if you're online in, in um, using, particularly in China, but even for, you know, Chinese nationals who are outside the country who might be using a tool like WeChat, um, you know, the, the privacy protections are minimal to non-existent. Okay, so there's that kind of technical and legal part of it. And we just need to separate that out from the potential for seeing this as, you know, the kind of, the kind of racism that Trump has used around uh, the pandemic, and and thinking of TikTok as somehow nefarious because it's Chinese. That that's a that's that's wrong. That's not the right way to look at it. I mean, it's possible that TikTok can become somehow um, independent of of Chinese. Uh, law and privacy uh, implications. I, you know, I don't know if that's possible, but I think we just need to have the discussion about it that's focused really in particular on the technical side and not on the fact that, that it's somehow Chinese and therefore is inherently problematic. That, and that's, that's my concern around, around the discussion. And, and the other part of it is, I don't think that American users of TikTok should you know, wake up this morning and think, you know, oh my God, China is surveilling me. You know, everybody has a different kind of threat um, um, sort of uh, um, profile. And, you know, for most Americans or most Europeans, most people around the world, it's, it's not an issue. Um, but for many, many people, like if you're using the tool in Hong Kong or using it abroad um, and you're talking about politics uh, and you're Chinese, um, then, you know, I'd be concerned but it's a different kind of concern. Thank you. If I could just, uh, um, well, thanks so much, David. Uh, that, that's very helpful to unpack because, you know, the conversation has been ongoing and uh, uh, the, well, opinions are, are quite strong on the, on the matter. Um, I, uh, well, on what you were saying, you know, trying to force ourselves to think beyond 
the US and beyond. I think that's also another important challenge when it comes to freedom of expression. Um, we, especially platforms, but also, and social media, social media platforms, and also free expression advocates, we need as much as possible uh, whenever we're thinking about the issues and the, and the challenges, uh, broaden our analysis. I mean, we have no other choice because like uh, Maria, like Luis and, and David have been saying, there are patterns and they're not localized. They're definitely like our network, completely international. So uh, it's, uh, it's important and that's something that at Antoine Sans Frontières we are really interested in and which we think and thank David for pushing uh, during his mandate is how to as much as possible bring together, build bridges uh, and, and collaborations beyond you know, our natural spectrum. So civil society, not only working with civil society, but also with companies and to some extent with governments, because I do think that many of them are completely lost and have no clue, including the most progressive ones, unfortunately, about some of the, the stakes that we're facing, the challenges. So um, I think, yes, this multi-stakeholder approach is really something that has changed a lot at at a very small level, but also at a more international level when, when it comes to internet governance and particularly freedom of expression. So I really hope this is something that will continue to be pushed. Uh, another opportunity that I see, and uh, I, uh, I mean, of course, it's an opportunity. Uh, I, I think the ability, I mean, like um, David has said in his, in many of his reports, and like many others have said, we need democratic principles governing this plat, I mean, the internet platform uh, as well. Uh, we cannot go on with an internet where decisions are made quasi arbitrarily uh, with very little oversight from either the public or, or, or other parties, not only governments. And yes, I do think that models um, in which some people would say the oversight board is self-regulation. I don't agree because I don't work for Facebook, definitely not. I am here because I'm very critical of their, honestly, quite irresponsible actions to some extent in some places of the world. So, uh, and, and I, I, I chose to work uh, with my very esteemed colleagues to bring the attention whenever needed to the platforms and have them stop pretending that they don't see things and don't understand things. So um, I, I, I accept it because, uh, because of that, because it's an interesting model experiment, like many have said, uh, of what can be done when we bring in outside eyes uh, in, within how companies function. And I do hope this model will be replicated not only in the freedom of expression uh, realms, but also in civilians, uh, in in uh, in press freedom. I mean, there are so many uh, so many places. This avenue definitely to make sure that not only comp that internet does not become a dialogue between only governments and companies, because we see that they. I mean, the recent decision by France shows that the cons French constitutional court shows that this is very limited but becomes truly a collaboration inc that includes civil society organization, which have been advocating against so many of the challenges that we're seeing now. Thank you. Thank you so much, Julie. There's, again, as, as you said, there's one of the things that comes through a lot of this is these issues aren't going away. And there's a number of experiments that are being done at the social media companies level and at others to see what we can really do on this. But I think kind of reflecting what David and others have said, the, the challenges are quite immense. Um, I think it's also important though to mention that the companies have immense resources at their disposal at which to put at this. And that's one of the, I think the key things that we can look at is when we look at the intentionality of companies and the seriousness of dealing with this is how much of those resources they're bringing to bear um, on some of these critical questions for protection of democracy kind of worldwide, not just freedom of expression. 
I, we've had some questions now. So if all of you panelists are okay, can I turn to some questions from people and direct them at you? Also feel free to add other questions for, for each other in the context of this. Wanted to start off with uh, you, David. So thinking about this transition that we're finding ourselves in now, celebrating the end of, of your mandate, moving um, on with the mandate, which has been great to see, what do you think are really the urgent things for the next Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Expression? You know, what, what are the research and advocacy gaps that are out there that you think need to be addressed to, again, address the kind of the fullness of the challenge that's facing freedom of expression globally? Yeah, it's a great question. I think it comes from Rebecca McKinnon. So hi, Rebecca out there. Um, yeah, I, you know, I think that there are, there are things, first of all, um, you know, my successor, I think one of the, the privileges of this position is, you know, it's up to her to decide, you know, what are the key areas to, to focus on. So I don't want to, I don't want to shape that uh, or impose any, uh, any kind of, uh, you know, constraints on, on what she might do. Uh, it's clear to me that many of the issues we've been talking about are not, are not going away. There's, the, the mandate has a, a kind of recurring challenge of communicating issues around, you know, journalist protection, the, the impunity uh, for attacks on journalists, for example, which has not gotten any better despite our focus over the years. I mean, Jamal Khashoggi was murdered by, by his own government um, in, in, a cons in his government's consulate in another country. He had you know, uh, residents in an yet another country and governments did virtually nothing. Um, other governments did virtually nothing in response. So there's a major challenge in, in dealing with that kind of situation. I think there's gonna be a major uh, ongoing major challenge in connecting economic, social, and cultural rights to particularly to internet access and freedom online, because uh, you know so much. I, I mean, this has always been a risk, the digital divide. Um, but but there's there's so much that is happening online that if people, because of extreme poverty, don't have access, um, it's not just that they have they don't have access to the economy. They don't have access to to being, you know, participants in public life, and so I mean I think there'll be a lot of issues like that um, that that'll be continuing challenges that um, you know I think that the whole community of freedom of expression advocates will be will be engaged in. Thanks very much for those reflections, David. Maria, if I could turn to you with with a question that's come in. Um, specifically, what can states at the Human Rights Council do to protect journalists and deal with the issue of impunity in the Philippines specifically, but also beyond? Wow. Um, I think, you know, I, I was actually just thinking about this concrete steps, right? The easy one, uh, we tend to, to talk about content moderation, the Facebook Oversight Board, Julie, right? But in the end, they're very, very simple things like, uh, as David suggested, uh, defining hate when it's being uh, used to incite hate against journalists, the kinds of hateful stuff, the toxic hate that is there. Um, it's hard to, I, I think the only thing we can, we need, that can do this would be regulation, which is in the hands of governments. But then in a country like the Philippines where the government is using this, uh, what do you do, right? Um, but the other thing is, is to really uh, realize that this is a, a key moment. And I think Canada and, 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 and Britain rec recognize this, that they, they were actually, through all of this, all of these attacks began in 2016, but the first two governments that then began to pull others together were really that, and that wasn't until July last year. So it's kind of a little bit late, even though David has been talking, writing, you know, there's been a lot written about it. We've written a ton about this stuff. I talked about Facebook algorithms in 2016. I wrote the first piece. Well, it was a series that we did, right? And that was part of what, what made us a target. So, you know, values, principles, where are they? You know, um, and, and governments are in charge of that, uh, I think, in, in that sense. So. The first is the technology, which, which everyone has mentioned. The second is um, 
remind us again of the values and hold others to account. I think that's because only countries can hold countries, other countries to account. Saudi Arabia is an example, of course, of where shocking to hear uh, President Trump say, you know, it's, it's very, that the business is more important, that money is more important. I think those are off the top, those are the two things. And then I think the last chunk, and this isn't really in government's hands as much as it is in civil society. I think we all have to recognize that this is just a completely different time that uh, if we all don't change the way we think about it, adapt the technology, collaborate far more closely than we ever have, then um, we will move this fascist swing is, is taking hold. And um, part of it is because it's helped elect, democratically elect leaders who are caving in inside. So um, I think the last thing here is, in the Philippines, I've started saying really truly that every one of us has to think about what we're each willing to sacrifice for the truth. So we've been talking about freedom of expression and, and freedom of speech, but in the end, this is a battle for facts. Uh, David mentioned algorithms, right? These algorithms have made it so that facts are debatable, and they're not. And there are real world consequences to this. So in the battle for facts, everyone is a truth teller. And I think this is, you know, silence is complicity in a, when you don't speak up in, in times like these. Thank you, Maria. Those are kind of really powerful thoughts to, to take us forward on here. And our own, bringing this back from the state level to the individual level and what our own responsibilities are here. I think we have time for one final question um, for, for you, Julie. Um, you mentioned the, the Facebook oversight board or the oversight board. You know, how is this oversight board hoping to take decision making for censorship um, decisions and algorithm decisions out of the hands of the corporate stakeholders? So I think there's a little bit of question there about is this really, is there a potential to really have impact on the, the operations of these large companies because of some of the decisions that you'll be looking at? So that's a fantastic question and it's an open one. I would like to remind first that uh, the oversight board will uh, have the responsibility of making decisions on content that Facebook has chosen to take down, but also on content that Facebook has chosen to leave up, which leaves open uh, the possibility to, uh, to ask questions. On top of that, during our procedures, we are allowed to request information from the company and also request information from, well, Amicus Brief, basically, if we could um, use an equivalent. So uh, I cannot speak, we haven't started operating yet, um, and we, we, we are working hard to do that very soon, but uh, I, cannot, I cannot therefore speak for my, for my colleagues, but one thing is sure is that we will use all the necessary tools that we have uh, to make sure that, well, human rights principles and free expression particularly are uh, at the, well, at the forefront of all the, you know, the processes and the, the decisions that are made by the platforms that are like made, po not positively, but in effect, but also those that are made implicitly, um, such as the decision to leave up content and let it be more visible. So uh, I, I cannot give a very precise answer yet, but what I can tell is we have tools and we will definitely make sure to, to use them to protect free expression and human rights in general. Thank you very much um, for that, Julie. I think there's going to be a lot of attention placed on you and the oversight board and it's a really interesting group of individuals that are there. So I think there's a lot of hope that when we saw the names of those who were going to be on the oversight board, that you know, maybe this could be a very useful experiment after all. <laughs> so congratulations on your appointments to that. And, and I think we'll all be watching very closely. Um, I wanted to move to kind of wrapping up the conversation now and to really thank all the participants who've been listening to this debate and particularly uh, the, the Permanent Mission of Canada. Thank you very much, Ambassador Norton. It was excellent for you to sponsor us and provide this opportunity for us to have this discussion. Um, Maria, you continue to be inspiring to all of us around the world. Thank you so much 
for what you're doing and for all you're doing to call attention to the other journalists in the Philippines who are also facing very, very challenging situations as well. Um, I know that we'll all be doing whatever we can to support you and the rest of your colleagues there. So thank you very much for that. Luis, the world would be a lot blinder if it wasn't for a lot of the work that R3D have been doing to kind of bring to light a lot of this surveillance technologies and how that's having an impact on journalists and, and human rights defenders around the world. So thank you again very much for that and continue continue holding NSO group to, to account, although you got to think at some point they're just going to ditch Pegasus and come out with something different with all the challenges that it's causing them at the present time, you know. Um, and then finally, David, you know, it's, it's been an honor and a privilege to, to work with you, both the Article 19 as an organization and individually. You've really pushed things forward so far in terms of our understanding of the dynamics of freedom of expression around the world. So thank you very much for that. Um, so I think everyone did a little clap for David and your man. They were the jazz hands that my children's school do to signal that they're approving. Um, but with that, I will turn to you for the last one minute for any final thoughts that you might have for us as we sign off. Oh, wow, the last word. Um, well, Quinn, thank you. Um, I, you know, the, the place I want to close is, um, is maybe two things. Um, so one is, you know, as I think everybody knows, uh, human rights law protects everyone's right to, to hold an opinion without interference and protects everyone's right to freedom of expression, which is defined in this really robust way as the right to seek, receive, and impart information and ideas of all kinds, regardless of frontiers and through any media. It's an international right. And, um, and I think people should, should keep that in mind. That's our touchstone. It's a robust right, and we should make use of it. The second thing is, as we're thinking particularly about the impact of new technologies that, that's pervasive, you know, my hope is, and maybe this is the big challenge, as, as Rebecca McKinnon was asking, like, what is the big challenge for the future? It's making that place democratic. You know, it's kind of taking back public space so that it is owned by the people. You know, whatever the people means, I don't mean to be a populist about it, but I mean to make sure that the sources of information are working for the public interest, that they're working for and not against democratic society. I think that is, that is a fundamentally huge challenge right now. And I agree with Maria that, that regulation is going to have to play a role there. I really hope that the European regulatory moves can be a model for the rest of the world. It hasn't always been the case. But I think that if we, if we keep in mind that, that democratic principles, that human rights principles are the ones that should shape the way we approach these problems, I think we're, we're, we're heading in the right direction. Groups like Article 19 are very much a part of that. And the other, you know, my co-panelists are, I think fundamentally that's what we're all about. And, um, and I'm, I've been privileged to work with all of you, not going anywhere. I mean, just gonna go walk the dog. But, um, you know, it's really just, um, just a privilege to be with all of you on this panel. And, and to the government of Canada, to Ambassador Norton also, thank you so much. We, we really absolutely rely on government support for these kinds of forums and, um, and for this kind of engagement. So thank you as well. And with that, and final thanks to everyone. Um, have a good day. Take your dog for a walk, David. Thank the dog for being very patient with all of us, I'm sure. Um, and a good day to you all. Thank you for joining us here for this discussion.